Assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa sahlan, hello and welcome to the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair's virtual sessions and in particular to this conversation which is with John Hudson who has written the book Appropriate for the Times, How to Survive. Um, John, welcome, thank you so much for being here. You are the UK's chief uh, military survival instructor. How are you doing in lockdown? Well, thanks very much for the invite, first of all, guys. It's a real pleasure to join you on this. And I'm, I'm hoping that, like most of the rest of the world, my lockdown's been fairly quiet because the last thing anyone wants is something too exciting to happen, is it? So, yeah, touch a little bit of wood over here. But it's been quite, fairly quiet. And I think it's, it's quite timely for us to have this chat because it feels a little bit like we might be through the, the thickest part of the woods. And um, the, a lot of the strategies that we'll probably end up discussing are equally applicable now, I think, that to the, the immediate period after anything bad happens. So a lot of what we're hopefully going to be able to chat about kind of is, will remain relevant. And yeah, but my lockdown in, in summary has been quite quiet, thankfully. Yes, it does. I'm glad to hear that. It does feel as if there are, there are sort of waves of this and mm -hmm. the emotions that come and the, the coping strategies that come with that change, don't they, as you go through time? They do. And there's some patterns that have been noticed throughout the past in all kinds of different periods of isolation for people. And like you say, my world as a, as a military survival instructor, the isolation that we train people for tends to start with probably a loud bang or maybe some kind of um, dramatic sinking at sea even that ends up with small groups of people in isolation. So throughout history, those events have been documented and I've been lucky enough over the last 20 years or so to study them, to identify some of the patterns and to teach people who might find themselves in the military in that situation how best to cope. But as we've kind of touched upon in the past, Julia, a lot of this can translate into the everyday. And I think it's really pertinent at the moment because all the coping strategies that we've employed in the past, I know are useful at the moment. And certainly from people who I'm in touch with via these kinds of meetings, I know that they're helping too. So yeah, I'm hopeful that whilst this is a bit of a hardship for everybody, it's actually potentially a period for growth. Mm. That growth mindset, that sort of yeah. open mindset is a big part of it, isn't it? It just, is. Just perhaps talk to us a little bit about um, how, how important that is, but actually um, how equally important it is to leave the old mindset behind. Yeah. To confront our current reality yeah and it is and the, the unique thing for our time uh, not necessarily for previous generations which i discuss in the book when we look at examples but for our time this is the first time that most people alive have had this collective kind of experience bizarrely albeit in their own isolated pockets but we're all experiencing similar kinds of things and the way i think that that translates into uh, growth for us all is up until now, we've been a very, very lucky couple or maybe three generations. We haven't really had too much, certainly not in the, in the kind of more affluent parts of the world, haven't had too much to trouble us. My day job means that we go and seek out that kind of hardship routinely and we're lucky enough to learn from the experiences of those in the past and apply their lessons. But for the vast majority of us, we've not really had that chance. And so I think Whereas a lot of literature to do with um, extremes has always been from a kind of a, maybe even a male, uh, an alpha male perspective about what they did and where they went and how they conquered or stood on top of something. I think now, much more in tune with what I'm interested in, which is how people from all backgrounds have coped in adversity. We've all now had a tiny little dosage of that. It's not going to be the same as kind of being stuck in an open boat on a harsh ocean that where everything's out against you we've had the the good fortune to be mostly at, at home notwithstanding obviously the healthcare professionals and the, the other essential workers who are really pulling up um, the hard shifts but for us in terms of hardship i think it's just a a constraint in what we're allowed to do day to day that is the first time for most people to have had any kind of handbrake put on their life and because everyone's experiencing it at the same time, I think there's going to be a real opportunity for shared growth. And so the growth mindset that we were kind of chatting about is where once you've experienced a little bit of hardship, you appreciate what you've got. And I reckon one of the key words we'll hear after this is gratitude. A lot of people will be really, really grateful for what they've got and what they're able to do. I know that's certainly true for, for us over here. 
And um, I'm sure quite a few of the people watching will have experienced a version of that where they're just really pleased to have the things and the people around them that they love. I know you're a big one for lists in terms <laughs> of to-do lists to get things yeah. done. Are you somebody who writes down as well as lots of people are at the moment, um, the things that they're grateful for at the end of the day? I haven't done that yet. I haven't, but I suppose that's, that's only through not having written it. I've certainly gone through it in my head. I've certainly reflected a lot and having that breathing space where perhaps because the lists are a little bit thinner at the moment and we're not at quite such a frenetic tempo, I'm not so uh, driven to complete things and move to the next space because we're staying in situ. We've got that extra time which we would normally spend traveling. I think that extra space, that extra time has allowed it all to decompress a little. And possibly because of that, I found myself reflecting a bit more on the things that I'm grateful for. Whereas in the past, I might not have had time to think about it and maybe I would have jotted it down as a sort of uh, a post-it note to self kind of thing. But yeah, I think mentally, definitely reflecting on the things I'm grateful for, not yet written it. What about you? Have you written anything down yet, Julie? I have, and partly because of reading your book, actually, that right. you're a big one for sort of... Um delegating to the, the pen and the page aren't you and right. I do find actually as, as a writer and journalist as well that actually writing things down it, it goes through so hmm. I've, I've been writing an intention every morning and I've oh. been writing things that I'm, I'm grateful for every evening again because I've got time to do it but I really hope it's one of those things that keeps going afterwards and I, I think that's, yeah. that's part of it isn't it actually yeah. we'll, perhaps we'll come on to the on to that um towards uh, later on in the conversation um, what you were saying about um, the whole idea of being in this together and having the same experience, mm. I heard somebody else describe it as, yes, we're all in the same storm, but we haven't all necessarily got the same boat. Mm. And there are different levels of this. Yeah. I wonder if you have any observations in terms of people perhaps feeling a little bit guilty that all they have to do, all they have to do is stay at home and not go out when other people have it much worse either in a personal situation because of health or as you say because they're on um you know on the front line in terms of key workers and actually saving people's lives there can be a little bit of um guilt that well i'm not feeling great about this and it's quite difficult but actually you know shouldn't i be a little bit happier and things ain't as bad as they could be yeah that's actually pretty common as a response in um, more dramatic type, uh, rapidly unfolding disasters as well. It tends to be anyone who is in a position of responsibility. So typically someone who was maybe piloting an aircraft that's force landed somewhere will feel guilty that they've got the passengers into that scenario. I think the type of guilt that we were touching upon just then though, that kind of um, lack of ability to, to do much, that feeling of wanting to get hands on and, and play a part, well, it's the kind of just a case of reframing that, that scenario. So one of the things that we touch upon um, in my world and that I talk about in the book a little is how to reframe things cognitively so that you understand which things you can control and, and that you therefore can affect and you accept those that you can't control. And if by accepting that we can't control our ability to move freely, quite rightly, because that would spread the, the virus, but that we also accept that it is our responsibility to stay indoors and to remain safe. Those of us who haven't got like jobs in the wider world at the front line of the, the health services, then there's no reason to feel guilty because whilst you may be inactive physically, you're certainly not inactive in terms of stemming the spread. So I think like with most of these things, it's more a case of reframing it. And one of the things that we would normally discuss with, with groups when I teach survival classes is that you're no longer the pilot or the navigator or a passenger. You're now one of a group of, say, eight people, and you're equally important. And you all bring something to the mix. And that's one of the harder parts of isolation. It's being in a confined space with people who, for whatever reason, you just have a little bit too much time together. And that's one of the common things that you'll look at in the past when we look at, I don't know, different professions who are used to it. A really interesting comment from a guy called Chris Hadfield, who's an international space station astronaut, said it's not about um, being with the right people in a capsule orbiting the Earth for months on end. It's about being the right person. So there's no real, re to, real reason to feel guilty that you're not doing too much, because by doing nothing, you're actually really helping. And if by knowing that it lightens your mood a bit, 
then that will also make you a nicer person to be around and it won't have any detrimental effects to the other people in your capsule as you sort of orbit this pandemic. The other thing that you talk about reframing in the, um, the appendix that you've written, how, mm. how to survive a, a pandemic, which I believe is going to be at the um, end of the paperback version, yeah, it will. available for free yeah. um, online, um, is about reframing isolation as being a time where you can't do anything to actually making that a useful time and learning something or you know pushing yourself forward in some way. Yeah. And when I drafted the the ebook, the, the free downloadable ebook that you mentioned, it was it was just beginning, it was early days. And I think there's possibly even now a bit of fatigue with people on the expectation of trying to achieve too much. And it's not really suggesting that everyone should learn the violin. You know, it's, it's Thank goodness. Yeah, I know, exactly. It's a case of making sure that you just don't kill this gift of time. You know, you're not wasting the time. Even if you're just thinking positively about your family or your friends, you know, that's a, a very useful way to spend your time rather than just killing it, flicking through endless, I don't know, TV series, that kind of thing. But there's nothing wrong with a little guilty pleasure now and then in terms of, a, a, you know, a low budget TV show. I've been in a few, but it's about doing the right thing by, by yourself, by yourself cognitively and making sure that you look after your mental health in these um, quite restrictive times. So yeah, it's, it is an opportunity for growth, but equally we shouldn't feel like we're under too much pressure to achieve something that's actually a little bit too much. One of the parallels that you bring out between survival um, in the wild, if you like, and uh, survival in normal life, and perhaps we can move it on to this specific situation um is about evasion so you talk mm. about how you evade people if you know people are trying to hunt you down while you're trying to survive yeah <clears throat> and you talk about actually digitally evading things in normal life yeah. and then there's this sort of extrapolation of that of getting a good balance between the information that you need in this mm -hmm. situation in order to stay safe but also evading this constant stream of information which to be honest keeps that idea of a threat coming which no. isn't necessarily a, a, a positive thing is it no you're absolutely right i totally agree with the way you expressed that as well it's the evasion in the book is more to do with um staying safe online in terms of not giving away too much personal information but equally it's about keeping your own time and headspace safe and I think that's the element from the book which really applies at the moment because it is possible were someone to want to to spend an entire day scrolling through a bottomless social media feed and you you would never you know you're never going to read all of wikipedia you're never going to read all of twitter and if you even if you search under covid hashtags you'll never read the end of it but the most important thing once you appreciate that that is a fact is that a lot of the stuff that on there isn't facts it's opinions and it's a kind of an the social media world is definitely a bit of an echo chamber and if enough people have repeated something then it's kind of passed off as fact and i don't know about you but i've certainly had the odd text message over the last few weeks telling me all kinds of ways that should be employed to defeat the virus which aren't true but people have read them they've not fact checked them they've thought it might be helpful and they've passed it on and that you know not to if you do pardon the pun, that viral spread of bad information is something that we need to be aware of. So what I've done, very much like an evader would do, is I limit when I listen to those information sources. Firstly, I make sure that it's a really credible source. So things like The New Scientist, I, I personally would read because it's a kind of peer-reviewed article-based document. Um, or I'd go to the horse's mouth. So the health agencies or the World Health Organization or the people I would seek out for, for what would be best practice rather than what in the past would have been the, the bloke down the pub, but is now just a, a nameless bot or a voice on social media. So I think it's really important that we, we um, check where we're getting our information from. But quite right, as you absolutely right, as you said at the very beginning of the question, it's how much, what dosage of information we have. And so to kind of get back to your original point when we first started chatting, I structure my day around that. So my list tends to be a little bit more open, but what I will do in my task list is I'll make islands of sanity where I break out from what I'm doing. And then in one or two of those, I'll probably check in, but only for a limited dosage of information because 
you know, things are moving fairly quickly, but it's not moving that fast that I need to keep rolling news on the bottom of everything I'm doing. I'd like to be in my, my creative bubble when I'm doing some work and then stop, update myself on what the situation is, move on. So I think it's important for all of us that we, we do have that structure. And that's just not, you know, I'm clearly not the originator of this construct. It's something we teach survivors. And it's also something that people in isolation in, in the past have used. So in the ebook, um, we talk about lighthouse keepers. Mm. Groups of three in the past, really, really isolated, have to get on with each other. But in order to do that, they have a very, very tightly knit structure for their day. So, yeah, I've kind of, um, I suppose I've kind of adapted those things really to, to fit this situation. That's a lovely story about the lighthouse keepers having a half hour chat and a cup of tea at the changeover of shift. And, and you use that to say, you know, call somebody, check somebody else is okay, be nice, even if you, you know, yeah. all you want to do is go off shift and go to sleep. Yeah, exactly. It's, there's, manners are free, aren't they? So be nice is a huge one at the moment, because I don't know about you, but when we're, we're out and about, some, some people seem to have taken social isolation to the wrong degree. So if we're getting our like half hour daily exercise, there seems in some quarters, or it has changed slightly, there seems to be a, a, almost like a lack of eye contact where, well, you know, two meters is, you know, you can, you can cross that distance with a friendly smile and a gaze. You don't have to ignore people, but to get back to the, the checking in and being a light keeper, then making that 30 minute window to check in like this, where you can see people is invaluable because you can gauge a lot by these nonverbal communications that everyone does, which you don't always get from a phone call. You can pick up intonations in the voice of someone that you know very, very well. But if you're just checking in on a distant, lonely relative or friend who's more isolated than most, then a video chat's ideal. Um, and half an hour is about the right amount of time because it's one of those sort of virtual coffee breaks or tea breaks that you can have, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's take you back to survival basics and perhaps right. out, out into the wild. Okay. Uh, tell us about the idea of the survival triangle. Mm. Well, there's, um, there are a few stages to any bad thing and psychologists that we've worked with back in the UK have very, very, very articulately defined the kind of the arc of an event with a beginning, a middle and an end known as a pre-impact, impact, recoil and then rescue period. The bit that I'm most interested in, I suppose, we, I like to look at the preparation and the planning phase of all these things and the good practices we can employ for any event. But the bit that interests me the most is how come some people cope with those situations and others don't what makes those kind of people tick how do they motivate themselves and it is purely self-motivation that's employed a lot of the time how do they persevere when everything around them is against them not just the climate but maybe maybe even the terrain probably even the locals when we were speaking about evading a while ago um, and so to kind of get to the bottom of that i spent a lot of time in self-isolation scratching my head thinking about the common themes and through all of those anecdotes and um, interesting stories from the past about people who have persevered the, the pattern that I noticed is a, a three-pointed perseverance engine where something got them started so they did something and it's a really important facet of any situation that we feel like we have some control so if we do something and we notice there's an effect on the, on the surroundings that we're in, then we feel like we're controlling that a little bit. That gives us agency, that in itself, and the key word to all of this, that engenders hope. Now, psychologists in the States many, many, many moons ago did some experiments where they proved that if we are just suffering, and now I'm thinking about physical or mental pain out in the great outdoors when you're probably on your own, if we're just suffering, that in itself will not extinguish our hope, our belief in a positive future that we, we inhabit. What will extinguish hope is suffering that we feel like we cannot control. And if that's the case, if we feel like we have absolutely no influence over anything and that whatever we do, it won't change things, that can extinguish hope. So therefore, to flip that around, in order to maintain hope, and generate the perseverance engine that we, we described a moment ago, you have to do something. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a big dramatic physical thing that we do. It can just be what we do in our own minds. Because a lot of the examples that I look at in the book and that I deal with in my day-to-day -day work involve things like people in life rafts at sea or people in solitary confinement in, in prisoner of war situations. So if we can do something that controls our environment 
and that then engenders hope. Once we have hope, all we have to do then is envision what we're going to do next in the future by a short term goal. Now, it's really simple in wilderness survival in the military because how to choose what to do next, that prioritization is a template that I know is plan, but that stands for protection, location, acquisition and navigation. Now, all that is really, if you really simplify it, is what's going to harm me first. In all these things surrounding me in the jungle, what's going to bite me, sting me, kill me first? And if I address that, then I'll move on to the next one and the next one. And by addressing the first one, I've already started to work. I've affected my environment. I've changed my surroundings. I've got agency. I've got hope. With hope, I can plan. With plan, I can work. Work, hope, plan. And it does really spin up. And it's surprising how quickly it'll spin up psychologically. Because I've done a few things um, where it's been very, very hard to keep going. The weather's against you. There's not a lot happening. I've been trudging across all kinds of fairly, fairly cheeky terrain, sometimes very cold and wet. But just simply knowing that one footstep makes me a metre closer to a campfire and a warm cup of tea, that will keep me going. And to extend that outwards, if I've got these little stepping stones which go to slightly larger goals, like a half an hour from now, I'll stop for five minutes and have a rest. Those sorts of things do help. And you can apply that to every situation. Um, so I've been doing a little bit of work around home while we've been locked down. And I'll do a 25 minute stint of work and a five minute rest. Because if I carry on working till I'm exhausted, my, my work rate drops. I don't do as much. It tails off towards the end. But if I do 25 minutes and then stop for five, or if it's something really physical, like I've been building a stone wall, if I'll do 50 minutes and then have a 10 minute break. Well, 10 minute break means I can have a cup of tea. And if I can drink a cup of tea, I know that that's rehydrating me. There's, there's some really good chemicals in tea that will make me feel better and perform better. And then the next 50 minutes, I'm far more productive. But all that is down to knowing that what I'm doing controls my situation. By controlling my situation, I'm maintaining the hope that it'll improve. And then I can plan and I can work. And the rewards are when you step back at the end of the day for a big pot of tea and you look back and you see that maybe three meters of wall have been built, several paragraphs of your new novel have been drafted. You've learned a few more chords on the guitar. You know, it really does translate from the wilderness to isolation and to every day. So yeah, that, that perseverance engine, the hope, plan, work, triangle it's probably that was my aha moment when i was writing just to tie all those thoughts together that have been kicking around in my head for 20 years or so oh, it, it, it really it all makes sense and the examples mm. that you use within the book of people who've used it and those that, yeah. that haven't um really mm. really bring that to life let's just talk about that plan part of it which is one one sort of tip if you like of, of yes. the triangle um, I thought it's really interesting that quite often what we think we need to do in terms of prioritisation is not what we need to do. And mm -hmm. you use the example of Amelia Earhart yes. uh, within the book of, 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 of not following it quite as um, successfully yeah. as others. Yeah. Well, the, the key thing with all of this is, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and, and we're not for a moment suggesting that if only they'd done this, it would have been totally different. You can't, you can't armchair quarterback those sorts of things. The guys, girls that I train um, have got incredibly busy day jobs. You know, they're very, very busy people, very intelligent, um, articulate people, but they've got tons of stuff that they have to know. Survival training isn't for everybody, so you have to make it really well in that not everyone enjoys it, I should say. And so you have to make it as simple and as palatable and as easy to swallow as possible. So the acronym plan that we're, we're gonna chat about is a real boiling down of quite a lot of, of thoughts into a very simple to bring back from the back of your brain to the front of your brain when things are bad around you. So it's a very easy to recall roadmap to success. And we can apply it anywhere. But that's been born out of years and years and years of hard-won experience. So back in 1937, when Amelia Earhart took off to fly around the world, she actually took off on the 20th of May, so around about this time of year. Her uh, aeroplane and her navigator with her Fred Noonan managed to get almost all the way around the world when they took off from New Guinea for a small island in the Pacific that was about halfway to Hawaii. They took off on the 2nd of July, 1937. And all that we know is that she arrived very, very close to the island and spoke to them on the radio but when they spoke back to her, she couldn't hear them. So she's transmitting blind, as we would call it in, in sort of airplane terminology. And importantly, they were also transmitting navigation beams that she couldn't find. But that meant that the tiny island in the Pacific that's surrounded by shadows of clouds that look like islands in the Pacific is almost a literal needle in a haystack. 
So they did what they could. They tracked up and down on a certain bearing. And we believe they found a different island because there's all sorts of evidence on the island that somebody, a Western female, in the late 30s, lived there for a few days or possibly weeks, but they were never, ever positively identified as being found or, or you know, seen anywhere afterwards. Loads of conspiracy theories, because it's the internet, but archaeologists have found fragments of clothing, fragments of products, fragments of navigational equipment that belong to somebody who fits the profile of a meteorite out. Right. The island that um, she was on was identified because navigationally, all around the Pacific, people are taking bearings on her distress calls and they, they circle in this sort of cluster of groups called the Phoenix Group. They could only have been transmitted if someone was on land and the only person who had a radio on that frequency in that part of the world was Amelia Earhart and they're transmitted on a daily basis during low tide at this island. So why wasn't she found? Well, they sent a battleship down there with airplanes on to look for her. It arrived shortly after she went missing. The airplanes from the um, battleship flew around that island and reported when they got back to the mother craft that they'd seen signs of habitation. You know, people had been walking up and down the sandy coral beach. There were footprints, there were signs of habitation, but nobody waved when they flew past, so they didn't land. That island that they flew over in 1937 had been uninhabited since 1898. Mm -hmm. So there weren't any islanders that could have been confused. Somebody had to have been there in that small window. The point about prioritization is that Amelia, we think, had tried to get some water, she tried to find food. She'd certainly built a small camp at the edge of the island and she tried to radio for help. But the one thing that she didn't do, which we always teach our students, is to signal with some kind of ground-based letter. So you'll see it in the news often these days. People put an SOS on a sand dune and that's how they'll be found. Now, maybe if she'd written SOS or help, the airplanes would have landed. But that wasn't in any survival priorities that were ever taught to people back then. It's something that we've learned since from this kind of experience. And the reason why that's important, well, your desk at work can feel like a desert island. And it's really important when you get there to know what's going to harm you first and that you have to put rescue above things like water and food in survival, just like you have to put dealing with the difficult but unpleasant task early in the morning while your energy's high, rather than leaving it till the afternoon when you're less motivated because you've sort of pushed it to arm's length. Because if you keep pushing it to arm's length, it'll never get done. And if it never gets done, you'll get in trouble with the boss. And if you get in trouble with the boss, that will harm you. So you can translate all these things into multiple different scenarios. But as an outline, I think Amelia Earhart's story is a great one because somebody survived on an island, a Western female, forced a period of time. But importantly, there was no fresh drinking water on Nicomaroro back in July 1937. And it only takes a few days in extremely arid places like we're both familiar with until you dehydrate to the point of death. Mm -hmm. So sadly, you know, expeditions have been sent out even in this last year or so, last 12 months. We don't know for definite what happened, but as a, a parable or a metaphor as to how to prioritize your day, I don't think you can beat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you draw such great lines between real life stories and survival out there and actually the day to day things in the, um, in the office and, uh, mm. and, you know, and, and for what we're, what we're um, thinking about now. Let's um, talk, if we can, a little bit about coming through, as you said, the, sort of the worst of things and people mm. thinking about lockdowns being opened up and they are already being in some countries, things are being uh, relaxed and so on. What are the things we need to think about in terms of that being the new normal and that um, the mindset of that, yeah, being that, that new reality, really? The, there is a, a, a phase during any survival situation, which is known as the, the rescue phase. Um, and I do think we can draw some parallels from that to, to this scenario. Um, there have been cases in the past where when an individual has been rescued, and this, this is like professional knowledge rather than any, anything that's captured in the, the book is written because it wasn't at the time something that we'd envisaged, but it, it might be another appendix thinking about coming out of lockdown. So it's known that if you approach somebody who's been in real hardship and you say to them, it's okay, I've got you now, don't worry, we're gonna get you home, they will relax. And if they've been in a very, very dramatic situation, uh, physiologically or psychologically sometimes people die in that moment we don't precisely know why but they can collapse and people have died um, if you look at the uh, millennium if you look at the death rates in hospitals 
they went up dramatically after January the 1st, 2000. And the medical profession think that's because people were waiting to see what happened as the clocks changed to 2000. And when nothing really happened, there's a kind of a, and people checked out in hospital, you know, they died. Now in survival terminology, that's known as giveapitis. And we believe psychologists like John Leach have written about this in um, clinical cognitive detail. We believe it's to do with dopamine pathways. So the kind of way we're wired up, that pleasure receptor that we normally associate with uh, fun activities, if that pathway is impinged, people typically in old, really austere situations like concentration camps can lose hope to the point where they go through a kind of a computer shutdown process. So that's a very, very worst case. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that this is what's going to happen after lockdown. What I'm saying is we all need to be aware of our vulnerabilities. And if when we're told that a period of something is ending and that a new phase is beginning, we don't, it's best not to reframe it as a barrier or as a, a, a big challenge. What we're best to do is to pace ourselves and gradually take one step at a time using the old perseverance engine to get back to the old normal because it will be impossible for all of us to go straight back to the way we were six, 10, 12 weeks ago. You know, it's a long period of chi uh, time and we have all spent a few weeks or probably months gradually changing, adapting to the current normal. I know from my personal experience when I've had uh, job changes. So I used to used to fly a long time ago as a helicopter pilot and I went to a completely different job. And then from that job, I went back to this role, the survival instructor role. And it is really hard to go from a lower tempo job to a higher tempo one straight away. We are all going to feel fatigued. We're all going to feel slightly mentally exhausted by a normal day that we would have taken our stride in the past. And we're all going to wonder what we did with our time during lockdown because the days, our days will gradually become so full, we'll wonder what we did in these spare moments. And that's another reason, I think, to make the most of the current positive, because it'd be a shame to leave this, this gift of time with any regrets that we didn't use it well. And we're going to be very busy when we get back to day jobs, we are. So the key thing to take away from that is, it'll take us a while to adjust. To feel tired and a little bit angsty is normal, but to take it gradually and to do it in small increments is the way to cope with that. That's an absolutely fascinating angle. I, I, that have, I have not thought about that. So I guess I'm, you know, everyone's sort of slightly here, aren't they? But it's really yeah. great to look up and think, thank you yeah. very much. And there's fantastic advice um, in the book, in the ebook, and as you say, maybe another um, appendix coming on. Maybe. Um, John, thank you so much for, for being here today. I must say that, do you know, my um, intention for the day today was be more John Hudson. <laughs> Um, and, and, and this conversation has only only made that that more the case. Um, I would just like to say thanks every so much to everybody for being part of the MW International Book Fair and the and the virtual sessions. It's great to have you here. Uh, do please subscribe to the channel, the YouTube channel. Keep an eye on Instagram uh, for more conversations that are coming up. And do please put comments below. We'd love to to hear what you think. But John, please, uh, I'm going to wish you luck both with your islands of sanity and your stone walling. Thank you. Um, and hope to meet you and talk to you in person soon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a pleasure.